rarely see, let alone taste, French wartime wine. Which is hardly surprising, winemaking's low on the list of priorities in times of war. But wine reaches deep into the soul of the French, so in the 1940s, despite widespread destruction, wine producers were left pretty much alone. Wine's carved out a, a very special place in the history of France and the Second World War. It's a time of occupation and collaboration. There was the resistance and ultimately liberation. And all the way through it, the vineyards of France have their own story to tell. 70 years on, it's hard to imagine what horrors the French went through under Nazi occupation. When the Germans took France in June 1940, they split the country in two. The north was under German military occupation, and the south was run by a pro-Nazi French government. It was known as Vichy France. On the border of the two zones in central France is the small Loire Valley town of Montrichard. In 1940, crossing the bridge over the river Cher that bisects the town, you went from the German zone to Vichy France in the south. The Vichy government was weak. That proud Republican slogan of liberty, equality and fraternity was replaced by work, family and the fatherland. There was no doubting where the real power lay. The Nazis were intent on breaking the French spirit, looting everything they held dear from art to sculpture and wine. Hitler, who some say didn't even drink, made it a mission to get his hands on as much of France's best wine as possible, and the German soldiers were happy to oblige. General de Gaulle, however, refused to lie down and accept what the Nazis were doing to his beloved nation. In the famous Appel de Joie radio broadcast from his exile in London, he urged loyal countrymen to fight on, and La Résistance was born. That call to resist inspired people all over France. Here in sleepy Montrichard, it was winemaker Jean Momousseau that personified the spirit of resistance. Before the war, he shipped wine in barrels all over France, and that was to be the inspiration for his own piece of resistance. He died in 1972, but his name lives on to this day, painted on walls around town. His youngest son, Patrice, followed him into the family business, and agreed to meet me to tell me about his father's involvement in the war. What was this thing he did with the resistance that was related to his wine making? He had uh, to pass very important people to free France. And to do that, he used barrel like this, put the guy inside, put the, 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 the top, and uh, bring in his truck uh, like he used to pass to go to fetch wine at the growers on the other side of the bridge. The Germans seen the, the truck moving with my father, with his barrels, it was normal, you know. Do you know any of the people who were put in the barrels? He, he transported two very important people, head of the resistance, coming from London, parachuted in behind Montrichard and put it in there and going to free France. He couldn't presumably talk about this during the war. This must have been incredibly no, no, secret. In, in, during the war, the family knew nothing, you know. You, your mother didn't know anything no, no, about no. this? Because it was a danger for everybody if you knew something. What would have happened if he'd been caught? They were killed. Mm -hmm. Ah oui. Just that the, would have been it? Yes. Luckily, the German soldiers were blissfully unaware of what was going on. News of this ruse didn't come out until well after the war had finished. Jean was later decorated for his bravery. But his genius was more than the idea itself. Building a barrel out of French oak and putting someone in it isn't as easy as it sounds. Good morning, Charles. Hi, Joe. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. In what is very clearly an oak-based business. The cooperage that made Jean's barrels sadly doesn't exist anymore. In fact, there are only around 50 cooperages left in France. But the Tonnellerie du Val de Loire still makes barrels in much the same way. To walk me through the making of the unsung heroes of the winemaker's trade is Charles Capbern Gasqueton. So that's the first stage, what we call la mise en rose. You put all the, the staves all together. There's only one big stave for the burn hole. And normally they do measures 
they do have measures, so they know exactly they have the number of saves they do need okay. to make a barrel. So it could otherwise just be like a puzzle. You just have exactly. to guess at exactly. which size to put in. So this uh, wood is a very, very tight grain from Santa France origin. So now we've got this. This is yeah. the mise en rose. Yes, yes. What do we do with it next? So then we're going to start to heat the barrel. And with the heat, we're going to give a nice curve. And so at the end, we can seal the barrel. So the interesting thing about uh, flavor from the oak is uh, it's a link with the temperature. So after 150 degrees, you're going to lose most of the vanilla side. And if you heat it higher, between 180 and 200 degrees, it's going to be a kind of burning side into the barrel, and it's going to be much more liquish. Yeah. So when you do work with uh, you know, heavy wines, like in Napa Valley, like in Bordeaux or other places, with Cab Sauvignon Merlot, they will love to have higher temperature. Yeah. When you do work with uh, Burgundy people, with Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, they like lower temperature. And you will have much more vanilla, and uh, you will have much more liquid side into Bordeaux wines. So you're a very integral part, then, of the final taste of wine. It's not just that it's uh, exactly, matured in this. You've exactly. decided kind of how much is what so the taste is going to be like. Yeah, it's, it's what we call the third flavor of the wine, which comes from the oak. So it's very important in um, both parts. The heat helps soften the wood so the metal braces can hold it in shape, which, of course, keeps them watertight. this fascinating cooperage, I realize there's an air of inevitability. The wine show producers have me over a barrel, or as it turns out, in one. I feel strangely honored to be invoking the resistance spirit of Jean Mousseau, but a few minutes later, the harsh reality of being trapped inside a barrel is settling in. I'll never look at barrels the same way again. overwhelming feeling of complete helplessness. I just got that feeling of you parachuted into free France. You've gone along to Jean Mousseau's house. Take you an hour to go and get somebody in this. And then you might be four, four hours or so going across the border, maybe longer, if there was a you know Nazi camp and there's Nazi check posts, so they're not letting people through. And then maybe another hour at the other end getting you out. So you could have been here for sort of six hours or so. I think I've lasted five minutes and I feel completely terrified. Any moment somebody goes, there's a bloke in there that's going to shoot it. And you're completely trapped. And it wasn't really until the lid went on, I suddenly thought, what happens if nobody opens it up? Oh, just a minute, something's happening. There's a truck coming. Whoa. Whoa. I'm listening desperately for anybody who's going to come and let me out. It's sort of not funny anymore. It's so noisy. That is one of the most uncomfortable experiences I think I've ever had. Adolf Hitler wanted to build a thousand-year Reich, but thanks to the bravery of Jean Mousseau and many, many like him, we can today toast a very different world. France will forever be in debt to the men and women of the resistance who are prepared to risk and, in many cases, give their lives in the name of liberté.